Welcome to the next video in the playlist Downstream Processing in the Pharmaceutical Industry. The video of today will focus on the separation of the particles. So once that, that would be like the initial step where you start to harvest the material and where the clarification happens. And I will mainly focus on three different techniques that you can use. Now, if we look at the primary recovery step, the first thing we want to do is we want to separate the whole cells from the culture broth. So that means we need to remove the cell debris, we need to remove protein pre precipitates and other things in order to obtain your pure product. And after that, you get the more fine clarification and final purification. So we'll really focus on the initial steps here that you have to go through. And the methods that I will be looking at include filtration, centrifugation, flocculation and flotation. Now, first have a look at the filtration step. As you know, this is a mechanical operation. So one of the key things you have to bear in mind is that you have to consider the cell viability uh, because that can be hampered by whatever technique you chose to do. Now, filtration, and the same applies to these other techniques, usually doesn't come on its own. It's usually not just one step. So it can be used in combination with centrifugation or other methods. And here, at first, I will focus on depth filtration, which is commonly used, and I'll explain to you why that's the case, why that's like a first initial step to start with. So this is a por porous filtration method where your particles are retained throughout the depth of the medium. So we're not just talking about the surface. Uh, and contrary to, for instance, membrane filters, these filters, they don't have a defined pore size and structure. Now, why this is really good, because you, you keep it throughout the depth of the medium, so you can have very high throughput uh, and you can also uh, cope with a high load of particles. So that makes it really beneficial to filter out the first preliminary things that you want to look at. And then obviously key parameters you would be looking at include the area that you've got, the flow at which you do it, but also the viscosity of the medium. So this de also depends on the particle load that you have. Now, as mentioned before, this depth filtration, you can handle very large process volumes and very high cell densities. And particularly in the last couple of years, you will see that the cell density just keeps on increasing and increasing uh, because obviously that will make it more cost effective. So this really handles fast separation. It's relatively low cost and it's also a scalable technology, which is very important if you look at larger scale. Now, here you can have a quick look of what in general such a train of operations would look like. Uh, so you'll see there's multiple options here. Uh, and here this really comes across, as I said, where we're not just looking at one particular uh, filtration or one uh, method to remove the particles. It's usually a cascade of different things. So many options and you can see that this, uh, this depth filtration often with like multi layer so you can filter out different things. Uh, combined with centrifugation is a good option. Now sterility also has to be uh, considered and then at the end you see cross flow which is something that we'll come back to later. So, so many different options and I just wanted to show this because this really illustrates why there is not uh, you know one single method is not good enough to just separate out the whole cells. But obviously filtration doesn't just come on its own. There's a lot of other techniques that we uh, can have a look at. Uh, and here you can still see this cross flow filtration, which you usually see at the end. So as mentioned, depth uh, filtration or centrifugation often starts at the beginning of the process uh, because it can handle these large volumes. But there's obviously other filtration methods that you can use. So I mentioned the differences here is, is that unlike in membrane filtration, you, you look at the depth of the material, but obviously we can also look at the surface and apply membrane filtration. Another option to consider, and I mentioned before, cell viability is really key, are for instance spill uh, filters, which can actually handle shear sensitive cells. So that's another good alternative to consider for certain mammalian system. Now, the one thing which you saw at the end was a cross flow filtration, but uh, nowadays more commonly tangential flow filtration, uh, which if you look at the picture, you can see that the feed stain goes like this and then the flow is this way. So unlike where you have dead end filtration, where all the flow goes through and then you start to get blocking at the pores. So really when you cross flow it, you minimize the fouling of the membrane, which is very beneficial. Now, 
there are obviously some key challenges that come with this and you will see this crossbow you usually see towards the end of these uh, filtration steps rather than at the beginning uh, which relate to and, and i think this applies for a lot of these other methods to share sensitivity but also the lifetime challenge of these membranes so how long before your filter starts clogging so how long before you need to change it now and this image is really just um, to give you a brief idea of where filtration spans across um, because obviously the pore size of the structure that you're looking at will determine what uh, you can remove from a solution so you can see for instance the particulate filtration which is relatively the biggest so here we look at something which is around micron sized so this could be for instance yeast cells and some bacteria or if you think of things you can see with the eye for instance like sand so that's towards the larger side of the spectrum now going towards micro filtration we slowly start to get in the region where you might be able uh, to filter off viruses even though they're probably a little bit smaller than that and then the ultra filtration which is even smaller so here we start to look at more at the nanometer range so this would definitely be in the range of viruses albumin so certain proteins that you can reduce and then even even smaller we can look at nano filtration which is for the removal of certain sugars for instance and then finally also reverse osmosis if we can look at ions so when looking at this filtration, you can span a whole range and depending on what you want to filter and which step, you will need to look at adapting uh, the, the size or whatever filter you're using. Now, having looked at filtration, another thing that's uh, recently been more and more used is centrifugation. So here, rather than relying on gravity, you use a centrifugal force used for separation of mixtures. So if you have a look here, you can see that the heavier objects, they move away from the axis, while well the smaller ones, the lighter one, they move towards uh, the middle. So basically, it's a good way to separate based on the weight. And you can separate, for instance, bacteria from proteins. But bearing in mind when you do this, and I would say that centrifugation is becoming more and more popular, but... Uh, because it's more cost effective because obviously you use like additional force to separate things out um, but it is more costly than normal filtration when you use a centrifugal force you do increase the temperature so again for cells if they're shear sensitive also maybe the temperature uh, they wouldn't like to have a temperature increase when you have these forces and then the final thing is and this also relates to the filtration there needs to be some kind of difference between what you want to separate out so if you have two things that are relatively similar in size and similar in weight, then centrifugation might not be the best option. So there needs to be a very specific difference here. None of these two actually work. Uh, we'll come back to like another method. It's called flocculation and flotation. And this is used for the separation of small particles. Now, with small, I mean when there's not a big difference so you can't for instance use centrifugation or with filtration that you're not exactly in the range that you need to filter out things so what you then need to do you need to add something to it in order to get like a critical mass in order to separate it out and um, so in flocculation you do this we're, we're dealing with a liquid here and it comes out as flux or as flakes and then you form this mass by the presence or you basically you add uh, something else. So this could be inorganic salts or organic polyelectrolytes. Now, this is, has got to do with the liquid. Uh, if we talk about flotation, you can imagine something would float to the surface. So here you would sparge with a gas. So you have cells that would absorb, for instance, to these bubbles, and then um, they would raise to the surface as a flume and they would start to float. Um, so very similar to the first method, but obviously the big difference is here that one is like a liquid and by the other one you inject a, a gas. You form foam. So the, with the, the, the last method, you do have to take care that you have uh, stability within the foam. So you need compounds like, for instance, fatty acids or amines to promote the stability of the foam. And like the previous uh, techniques, this doesn't come on its own either. So here you will see a certain example. 
So, you, for instance, this is quite often used in wastewater treatment. So you have some water, you add some coagulants, and then you will see uh, that this flocculation process. You start to see these flakes um, that are starting to form. Now, obviously, you need something after that to remove these flakes. So you probably still need a filtration step, and in this case, uh, the show membrane filtration in order to filter out the flock. So it's always a combination of different things. Now, in summary, what should you have learned from this? Mainly, I've discussed three methods for separation of particles that happen very early in the downstream uh, processing step, so from the recovery step and some of the clarification. So it will uh, enable you to take out some of your product, but it wouldn't be fully purified yet. And I've shown to you that you're not just using one method, often these are used in combination. When would you want to use these methods? Now, filtration, uh, especially since depth filtration, is very common as a first step for the clarification. It's relatively easy to use, it's very scalable, and as I've showed to you, it can be used so you can tailor it to remove a range of particles. Now, centrifugation has a higher equipment cost, but you will see over the last couple of years there has been an increase in po popularity. Because it's very fast, because you use centrifugal forces, so it can be more cost effective. And relatively speaking, you can also use small equipment for it. So it can be very beneficial when you look at, like, for instance, the footprint of a plant. Now, when both these techniques don't work because you don't have like a critical mass as such, so you can't easily separate based on the size, then you would need to use techniques such as flocculation and flotation. So you would then add something to it, and I've shown to you this can be a coagulant, but we can also sparge with something, and you form particles, and these particles can then be removed afterwards. So hopefully this video has given you a very brief insight in how to de how these techniques actually work. Um, and later on in this playlist, you will see where we go more in depth into purification. And you will also see more case studies to understand how this downstream processing really works in the pharmaceutical industry. Thanks for watching.